Hello and welcome, Sunnyside. How you doing today? Today we have a nice little service for you. We're trying to do things in a different light, in a different way. And the Lord blessed us to have this little studio next door to the church. So we're, for the first time, utilizing our studio. I hope you enjoy the service that you're about to uh, see. And if you have any contribution and you want to participate, just let us know. God be with you and God bless you as we serve and honor God in these next few minutes. Amen. attention and he surely has it now please be aware that there are a number of things that's still happening that you need to make sure that you don't forget one of those things is the 2020 census again don't be distracted that's a very very important count now there are a number of things in, that are to be answered as part of this census so don't be frustrated by it. Don't be thrown off. They're simply going to ask for your first and last name, your age, your birthday, your race or ethnicity, your sex, and relationship to the head of household. They're going to ask you also whether or not you rent, <clears throat> excuse me, or own your house or apartment or a mobile home. Then they, they very well may ask for your telephone number in order to just verify the information. Now, if a question comes up about your social security number or about your citizenship, hang up, okay? Again, taking part in the 2020 census is very, very important. Do know that since the census comes out every 10 years, and as a result of the census, Billions of dollars are allocated to the states. So make sure that we don't miss out on that. At the same time, do know that count is important because it also determines our representation in Congress. Now, every state has two senators, but for members of the House of Representatives, it depends on the number of people in the state. Okay, so make sure that we don't miss out. Today is the birthday of our own sister, Della Love. She's 95, she's 95 years old today. She would love to hear from you. At the same time, be aware that she has a hearing problem. So the best way to communicate with her might be to just send her a note to just let her know that you're thinking of her, that you love her. Sister Della Love. The library has just a wealth of information. Make sure you stay connected. Now you cannot necessarily go in and sit down at this time, but you still can call and stay uh, connected that way and get answers to the many questions that you might have. I am one of the LA Soul Steppers, AARP, okay, those seniors. On the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month, we exercise. And it has been at the Baldwin Hills Mall. But you know that's closed down along with other malls. However, if you go online to AARP Soul Steppers LA and stroll down, you'll see Coach E, who has coached any number of professional athletes. But he's giving us some tips on exercising. People would get upset with me when I would say, hey, we meet there at 6 a.m. in the morning. This way, you can 
Again, turn in and exercise anytime it's convenient for you. Again, AARP Soul Steppers Los Angeles. We have not been meeting for a while because of what has been happening really in the nation. There is a worldwide pandemic and we're caught up in it. We are part of the world. There are some things that you must do in order to be safe. Okay, first of all, make sure that you wash your hands a lot more frequently than we have in the past. And there's also a thing called social distancing. Leave some space between you and the next person. Part of the reason that the, it has become an epidemic is because so many people are contagious and they're not even aware of it. So one way that you go about doing that, about helping yourself is to by wearing a mask. As you leave your house, as you go outside, feel free to wear a mask. And it's for your protection as well as for others. Now, don't get upset because you don't happen to have a mask. Ladies, look in your drawers, okay? Look in your closet. You have masks that are hiding in there, okay? What I have around my neck now, you have plenty of them, okay? They're headbands, okay? They also serve as masks. Voila, no problem, okay? So again, take advantage of what you already have. Go back inside that closet. You have some beautiful scarves. Take those scarves, okay? One side, it doesn't have to be even. Take that scarf, put it at your forehead. Wrap it around back. Cover your face. Tie it. You're ready. You're ready. Okay, I need to take this one off. All right. Again, it is as much for your protection as it is for someone else. Okay. Again, look inside that closet of yours. Take that scarf that you wear to church on your nice, beautiful suit. Okay, it's not doing anything but hanging in the closet now. Take it. Uh -oh. Hope I'm going slow enough so you can get it. It is for your protection. It is for your protection. If you don't want it on the side, okay, you can twist it so that it ties in the rear. Again, it's about your safety. That's why we're not meeting right now. But again, his word continues. He is always with you. I want to encourage you, make use of the services that are available. Do know that testing is available in our community. And again, our community has been hit really hard by the pandemic. Note now that you can get testing at Crenshaw Christian Center on 79th and Vermont, at the Charles R. Drew Campus on uh, 1731 East 120th Street, also at the LA Forum. You know where the LA Forum is. Okay, I suggest that you call first to make sure that uh, testing is available for you. Feel free now to listen to radio station KJLH, okay, 102.3. They give up really great information, current information on a daily basis for our community. Okay, so again, in closing, cover up. Stay put, go out only if you must. Social distancing, and just do know, he has our attention, but he also gave us common sense. Let us make sure that we use it. Thank you. Hey, what up, Sunnyside? It's your boy, Bouchard and Glover. 
And uh, we're doing something different during the uh, pandemic, and uh, we still want to stay in contact with our worshipers. And I have the opportunity today to actually bring a small little message. And um, Lord, I thank you to on today, and I praise your mighty name. And Lord, move me out the way and allow me to l deliver this little small synopsis of a message so that your people could have peace during these times of trouble. And now that God has our attention, now he surely got my attention. I'm sure he has yours as well, because now we're all quarantining and uh, we're all being challenged. And the question is, how do we get out of the wilderness? Because the wilderness is associated with the Israelites when they were actually uh, removed from slavery from Pharaoh and God had to part the Red Sea. I'm sure most of us know the story, but they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So what do we do during this time? Do we sit back and wonder or do we prepare? Because they say preparation prevents poor performance. Now, history repeats itself only when God's people turn away from God just and just, just rolls with the flow of the adversaries, meaning you're just rolling with the punches. You're doing what everybody else is doing. You're not stepping out and, you know, being a Christian. You're not being, you know, you're not going against the grain. You're basically just rolling with the flow of our adversaries, oppressors, stressors, and those who cause us harm and those who desire not to do the will of God. Now, one of the simple things that we have to understand as, as Christians and as believers, God does have a will. He has a will for my life, your life, and everybody else's life. But to make it plain, we have to figure out what God's will is for us individually. But before we start uh, trying to figure out exactly his purpose for us individually, we have to understand what his intentions is for us as Christians. Now, as a Christian, in the book of Thessalonians, um, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 18 says, give thanks in all circumstances for God is will, let me say this again, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. So God's will for us is to give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what the situation is, just like we're going through this trial right now. So I think we need to start giving thanks. You know, stop worrying about what's going on in our lives. Stop being so concerned about the news channels. And sometimes we just need to just take a break and just thank God. Because when, 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 when a human being says thank you, when a man says thank you or a woman says thank you, there's an immediate reaction or response in the normal realm. And in that normal realm, if somebody told me thank you, therefore, I would turn around and say, you're welcome. So if we're telling God thank you, we can only imagine the blessings that we receive from his you welcome because we got he we has uh, he has our attention and we letting him know that one of the things that's in his word that we are doing is basically thanking him in all of the circumstances because that is his word and you can never go wrong with that okay and it feels good like i said when i give my son And the love that I have in response and admiration for my baby girl, my son, you're welcome. And is there anything else I could do for you? You know, but when you think and it, when you, you know, when you're doing things and, and you don't have the right mindset, you know, and the right intentions and your mind is not right. So that's when we begin to struggle as individuals because our mindset might not be on the wave of God, but it might be on the wrong wave. So we got to check ourselves and make sure that we're serving the right God, because the Bible says that there are many gods. Now, in these days and times, you know, we could use the benefit by hearing from God. We need a word from God. I know I, I've been trying to get a word from God recently because of what's going on, because I need this to make sense, you know. And wouldn't it be awesome to know that the word that you hear is coming directly from God? See, a lot of people, we believe, a lot of people believe, I believe it's going to happen. But sometimes when you know, when you know without a shadow of a doubt, that is the, the game changer. 
just like the confidence of somebody asked me if, if I know my name by birth certificate and if somebody told me that wasn't my name, I'm not going to argue and debate with these people to try to explain to them who I am because I know who I am. So we need to stop getting offended and being defensive when, pe when people that we know are lost because we might be lost with them. So therefore, we have to declare, we have to step our game up and make sure that we're on the right sheet of music because God is always in control. Now, in the scriptures, we're dealing with uh, the pandemic right now, and you could call it a curse, okay? Now, in the scriptures, now, a curse, because this, this is a curse. Now, the curse is the application of divine law that allows or brings judgments and to their consequences upon a thing, person, or people primarily because of unrighteousness. And I'm going to say that again, primarily because of unrighteousness. Now, if I told you we're suffering from this pandemic and we're, you know, losing our minds and going, things are going crazy, why? Because of we're being unrighteous. So if we could flip that, then therefore we must become righteous. Now, curses are manifested are manifestations of God's divine love and justice. Now, they may be invoked directly by God or pronounced by his authorized servants. Now, sometimes the full reason of the curses are only known to God. But in addition, a curse state is experienced by those who willingly disobey God. So as a nation, I'm sure we willingly disobey God because we can't even agree on anything as a nation. Because the Bible talks about being on one accord, but clearly as a nation, we are not on one accord because the Sadducees and the Pharisees clearly don't like one another. Now, for God's people, it's time to uh, develop, manifest, or breed people of righteousness because unrighteousness is winning. Unrighteousness is winning the game. Now, the game is not over. We got time. God's going to win in the end, but the unrighteousness is winning. So we're in the fourth quarter. The unrighteousness is up by 10, but we got to win this game. We know we're going to win it because why? We got God on our side, okay? We got God on our side. Now, the Lord may remove curses because of the individual, that's me, or the people, and that's you, for their faith in Jesus Christ and the obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel. So what it looks like if we practice righteousness and if we start doing things the right way and praying and, and telling God thank you and saying thank you on, on a daily basis and, and, and a few hallelujahs, which, which is the highest praise, I believe we can start to shift the atmosphere because the positive energy must block out the negative energy. So when you look at the world and how it is today, sometimes the nation to get rich, you got to do some bad and cruel and evil things. You know, to be wealthy, you don't have to be honorable. You don't have to be a lover of God or a lover of man. You can just go out there and do your do, but death and jail may come. Now, when we go through these trials and we have to get out of these situations, it's, a clear, it's clear right now because I'm telling you, God's people going to have to show up and show out. I'm talking about now. Preparation prevents poor performance, and it's time to get to that next level right now. We cannot wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years. As a matter of fact, we shouldn't be wandering at all. We should be building for the next 40 years from where we are right now. But it's going to take some, the love of God and the love of, of, of those, those, those commandments that was broke down to two. Love God with all your heart, mind, and your soul, and then treat your neighbor as you treat yourself. But that's where sometimes the issue comes in because how can I love my neighbor as I love myself if I don't love myself? So self-love is the best love. We got to ask ourselves, do we really love ourselves? Because I could not do anything to anyone that I wouldn't want them to do to me. You know, but if, I'm, if I don't love myself, if I'm depressed, if I'm suicidal, you know, if I'll pull a trigger on myself, then therefore I may pull a trigger on somebody else. So we got to stay prayed up and make sure that we're doing, do, doing what we're supposed to do and sticking to, that, to, the, to the right source, and that's God. Okay? Now, to let you know that without a shadow of a doubt that God has issues with those who goes against him, 
You know, and you can find that in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with your heart and with all your soul. Now, this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And like I aforementioned, some people don't even love themselves. So I think right now you have to look in that mirror and fall in love with yourself and thank Jesus for him creating who you are so you can become that individual that you are to become because everyone has a purpose. Now, in closing, now that God has our attention, how do we get out the wilderness? Now, we have our instructions from God in the midst of this storm. Now, if we don't prepare and strategize in the midst of the storm, then we won't be equipped to build when the storm is over. Now, we must move past the survival mode. See, a lot of times we just want to survive, but we have to move past the survival mode because when you truly love God, you know you're going to survive. You know it's, you're going, it's, it's going to be all right, but we have to move past survival mode. Now, if we believe, we must move past belief because we're living in a time where you have to be bold and you have to know who you are and who God is and who you belong to. Now, we must be proactive and not reactive. We must be positive and not negative. And we must be optimistic and not pessimistic. Why? Because this is what some of the mindset to some of the rudiments of God. And I say this because I know without a shadow of a doubt that those are at least three rudiments of the mindset of God. And I will add another rudiment to those three, and that's righteousness. Now, righteousness, righteous or righteous acts in the eyes of God will grant us rewards from God beyond measure. Now, we're being challenged by God to do his will. Now, this is a must. So we must know the mindset of God because the mindset is connected to his will, and his will is connected to him. So if we could connect to God's will, then we're in his will. So we're connected, living in safety, maneuvering through life without having to worry about what's going on in this earthly flesh. Now it's time for us to live peacefully amongst each other, seek righteousness at all times, and continue to introduce Jesus to a dying world. And I'll close with this. And it's in the book of Proverbs 18 and 13. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and that's what they are saying. And may God bless the world. Amen. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. Lord, I praise you and lift you up and I magnify. That's why my heart is filled with praise. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you a special way Lord I praise you
Hello and welcome. I pray the Lord has been treating you real good and blessing you even through this time of heaviness and craziness that God is still God. I hope you remember that. I also hope that you did your homework. Remember we're studying out the For God So Loved booklet and there are 10 lessons in this booklet that we want you to cover. The first one was being the first one being God. We studied God, but I gave you some homework to do. I gave you uh, two scriptures to rewrite. Did you do your homework? I sure hope you did. The first one was one that's very familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Wanted you to rewrite that in your own words. How would you rewrite that? I had a young person uh, a group of young people do this assignment, and one of the young people wrote this. He says, the Lord is my road dog, and he goes everywhere I go. That's knowing God. And then the second scripture is, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? That should give you comfort because it lets you know that God is always not only with you, but there's nobody bigger or powerful, more powerful than him. Today's lesson, we're going to study love. And everybody talks about love. Oh, I love you. We get off the phone. We say, baby, I love you. And do we really mean it? Do we really understand what love is? It's easy to say, but it's very difficult to live. This morning's lesson we, we study this word, and there are three different ways that love is explained. Uh, one is eros love. Eros love is sexual love, and we know about that. We, we have a lot of problems with that one. And that one, we, we, we hear songs about. I heard that uh, one radio station is playing the oldies but goodies from Luther Vandross and, and all these other sexual you know, uh, who was that, Marvin Gaye, and he, they would get us in the mood for Eros love. And that Eros love got some of us in a lot of trouble. Uh, Samson, it got in trouble. David, it got him in trouble. So that love has to be controlled, and, and one of the things that I found in the scriptures that amazes me, it says when you fall into lustful situation or lustful love, the, the best thing you could do the Bible says is flee, run, because that is a deep fire that will burn you if not used correctly. The Bible wants us to be in one union with each other, to love our mate who he has chosen for us. And it's important we find that mate. And we find a lot of mates when we find friends. And that's the second kind of love, filios love. Filios love is a friendship kind of love. And that's, that could be a friend um, of a same sex, different sex, but that person and you just click together. And you like talking and being around that person. They give you joy and understanding. And then the last kind of love is agape love. This love is centered in our relationship with God. Because that's how God loves us. It's undeserving, unfaltering, unequivocal, total love. Yes, total love. You say, well, what about when I do something wrong? Yes, he still loves us even when we do things wrong. He may not like what we did, but that does not keep him from loving us. Think about this. I got a grandbaby. And, and this is my first grandbaby. And sometimes she wants to get in things that she shouldn't be getting into. Or she does things that she shouldn't want to do. But she does them. And when she does those things, do I stop loving her? No, I may hit her little hand. Or I'll say no. I may even be a little disappointed. But Lord knows I still pick her up in my arms. And I hold her tight. And I let her know that it's going to be all right. And that's how God does us. So when you sin, 
Yes, you feel guilty, and yes, you don't want to be in his presence, but guess what? That's when he wants you in his presence. That's when he says, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come to me, though your sins be as scarlet, Isaiah said, though they be red like crimson, bloody red. I'll make them as white as snow. He said, but we got a reason together, and you have to learn to grow in me, and that's what a relationship with God is all about. And this morning, I, I, I found in the scripture in Genesis 39, there's a story of Joseph. And he's in who they call Potiphar's house. Potiphar was a ruler of Egypt. And, and even though Joseph was sold by his brothers, uh, he wound up ruling in this house of Potiphar. But Joseph had some problems. He had all three of these. He had the wife of Potiphar lusting after him. And he was running from her as best he could. Potiphar was his friend who he admired and appreciated. And Potiphar was his friend and put him in a high position, the highest position in his house. And then lastly, Joseph loved God. And his love for his friends, for Potiphar, they were real. And God wanted Joseph to succeed. So he entered Joseph's heart. And because of this, when Potiphar's wife attacked jo Joseph, that's right, she attacked Joseph and said, come on, my husband's away. I know y'all don't know nothing about this kind of situation. So Come on, my husband's on a trip, and I need to make love to you. And Joseph ran, and as he was running, she grabbed his shawl, like his shirt, and ripped the shirt, his shawl. But he got away from her. But she lied on Joseph and said that he tried to attack me, and I got his shirt to prove it. Have you ever tried to do right? in a wrong situation, and you got blamed? So when Potiphar came home and his wife told him the lie, he had Joseph put in prison. But God still loved Joseph. And God was with Joseph. And to make the story a short story and not go into details. I just want you to know that Joseph, by loving God and God loving him, not only became, was over, he wasn't just the ruler of a house. He became the ruler of Egypt, right under the Pharaoh. God will take you into places that you never thought if you trust and believe in him. Now, in this story of love, that's, that's great, but C.S. Lewis, a writer, Christian writer, wrote this, love becoming a god becomes a demon. Oh, some of you could preach on this one right now, because you've let people into your life who become your gods. You've let somebody in your life that you, you let di dictate what you do and how you do it, when you do it. And we that person becomes the ruler of your life and not God. Some of us let money come into our lives. It, it, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, I can give you examples right now with stimulus packages and all of that stuff going on right now, but are they doing it out of love? Or are they doing it to get your vote and affection, to get you on their side? There's an old saying that says, love may be blind, but it ain't deaf and dumb. And some of us act like love is deaf and dumb. We hear people talking and we know they're lying in our ears. But because they're saying the words that we want to hear. Oh, I remember in the 60s and, and, and you know, uh, uh, there were some brothers who, you know, the rap was important back then in that day. The, 
the ability to talk to a young lady and, and brothers would come up and say, baby, 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 well, let me just talk to you. And they whisper in their ears and tell them, oh, you the most finest thing I ever seen in my life. And, and, and even in one movie, uh, Spike Lee's movie, he said, baby, I'll even drink your bath water and, and all these kinds of crazy things. And you know they lying, but you like what they saying. And even in the church, preachers will lie to get you to do what they want you to do instead of going by what the Bible says to do. And because it sounds good and tickles our ear, we will listen to them instead of God. We need to fall in love with God. And, and Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And they hear me. And they follow me. In Ephesians, it says that Christ Ephesians, the third chapter, says that Christ wants to dwell in you, in your heart. And when he dwells in your heart, <laughs> let me tell you, he says that, that when I'm in your heart, that you will not be able to comprehend my love. For you will not understand the depth, the height, the width. None of these things of how much I love you. And it will go beyond your understanding. As a matter of fact, it says this. I want you to be able to know this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which surpasses your knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God and now unto him to do that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to his riches and glory to him be glory in the church of Christ that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think because he is God and he loves you. And what can a God do that loves you? Oh, my Lord. If we could just trust and believe that he loves us that much and that he would take care of us no matter what the situation is. You know, some of us know that our parents love us and they'll go out of their way to help us. And even they'll go out of their way to correct us if they love us. I know that I can relate to many of you who know about the whooping rod or the good belt or the switch or the extension cord. Oh, we could go into stories what was used on your rear end to straighten you out. All because what would the parents say? I'm doing this because I love you. And Lord, that was hard to understand as it was mm, 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 on that behind. But we know that that helped straighten us out and helped us to learn good from evil. And we asked ourselves today, what is love? And the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians says this. That love is the most important thing that you can have and the most important thing you could do or react to. It says in the 13th chapter, that first verse, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. That means though I can preach, though I speak in tongues, I have the gift of tongues, I have the gift of interpretation, but I have not love. I am just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Words mean nothing without actions, and love has to be centered in the heart. The second verse is somewhat like that, and it says that though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and I, and, and I have all understanding, and though I have all faith, so that I can even remove a mountain, but have not love, I am nothing. Oh, I wish somebody would tell the president this. 
that he may know everything. He may be the wisest person that he knows in the whole universe, as he claims. But I know somebody who says that means nothing if you're not using it to love people. If you're not using it to draw people in and not separate them. That if you're not using it to bring compassion and love, it means nothing. And this is the one that really gets me. It says that though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profit, profited me nothing. That you can give everything you have, you can be a good giver and, and, and you want to get along with everybody and, and you could be nicey nice and, and every time you see a homeless person, you give them a dollar. You can do all of that. And even the Bible says you can sacrifice your own body for a good cause. But if you didn't do it in love, it means nothing. So you may ask right now, well, what is love then if you do all these things and it's not love? Listen to this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave unruly, does not seek its own way. It does not provoke. It does not think evil. Love does not rejoice in secret sins, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Love never fails. But where there is, there are prophecies they will fail. Where there is tongues, they will fail. Where there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. And if you didn't know it, the Bible says that God is love. That at the center of everything I'm talking about right now is God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall never perish, shall never die, but they shall have everlasting life starting right now. Jesus, when asked, what is the greatest greatest of the Ten Commandments. He broke the ten into two, and, and it, 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 we would call that today downsizing. He downsized the Ten Commandments into two, the first being to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And the second was like unto it, for he said, and to love thy neighbor as you love yourself. God has to be your first love if you're smart. And all other loves have to circle around that love. He has to be your nucleus, your center, your hub. And, and everything you do, every decision you make has to be centered in him because he knows you best of all and he loves you best of all. He knows what's good for you. And then I, I, I like this because... You see, you can't love another person if you don't know how to love yourself. And many of us suffer from this lack of love from ourse for ourselves. And, and we talk about ourselves physically. That we don't like something about what God made. And what you're doing is doing just that. You're talking about something or someone that God made. God made you special. God made you the way you are. Who are you to downplay that? 
And then the second part of that is you can't love yourself because in your mind you're hearing these voices in your head telling you you're not good enough. You, you're not smart enough. You don't have what it takes to make it. Well, that is a lie from the pit because you know that if God made you, he gave you everything inside of you to be successful. Yes, we get in our own way. But God will prepare a way for us. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I also want to share this for my church folks. When Jesus came, he, he didn't just give two new commandments. He gave a third new commandment. He said, by this, in John 13, 34 and 35, shall all men know that you are my disciples, and that you have love one for another. And, and, and in those two scriptures, 34 and 35, he mentions one another three times. Love one another. As I have loved you, you love one another. Oh, I wished the church could write this on the front of every front door of the church. That you're entering here with brothers and sisters who you're commanded to love. And if, if your church, and I know your church may be not, uh, your church may be perfect and good and all that, but, but I found that in many churches, the opposite effects. That, that, that many people have been hurt by the church and hurt not because, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the people uh, loved you so much, but the but people hurt you. And let, let me say this, too. We got to get our hurt right. Just because somebody doesn't do what you want doesn't mean they're wrong. You may be hurt because you didn't get your way. You may be hurt because somebody told you the truth. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who loves you in spite of yourself. Somebody who loves you even though they didn't agree with you. They come to you and say, I'm sorry you don't agree, but I love you anyway. Please forgive me for hurting you, but I love you enough to stick to what I think is right. And we as Christians, even this as your homework now, I, I, I want to give you some homework. I want you this week. To call somebody that maybe you hadn't got along with. Oh, this is going to be hard. I want you to call somebody that may have hurt you. And I want you to have a little talk with them. Now, now do this after you've had a little talk with Jesus. And let the Holy Ghost be in your conversation. But how wonderful it would be if you called them and just said, I just wanted to tell you that I do love you. You don't have to bring up the past or anything else. But if your heart is right and you're sincere about it, tell them I love you and I want you to know that I love you. And that's the most important thing about this conversation. I will end this, this, this lesson with, with this story that my father who... who when my mother left, he did nothing for not only her, but the six children that went with her. And he intentionally told me later on in life that he did it to hurt her. But the thing was, I grew up hating my father. Until I became a Christian. And as I was trying to pray one day and I couldn't pray, my father came to my mind. And I, I, I said, oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, him too. I, 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 I don't hate him. Well, I did something worse than hate. I had put him into my non-existent category. You see, you can hate somebody that exists. But if they don't exist to you, it doesn't matter. And so I tried praying again, and, and my father came to my mind one more time. And a few days later, I, I, I with my holy self, I, 
I'm praying all holy and everything. And my father for the third time came into my mind. And the spirit said, call him. And I went through the conversation in my mind. I said, I have nothing to say to him. What can I say to a man that deserted his ch six children and his wife? What can I say to a man who did not love me? What can I say to a man who, who never gave me anything but some Buster Brown shoes? And they were so ugly that the, that the kids at school laughed at me when I wore them. And I love that the spirit is re re relentless. And he said, the spirit said to me, call your daddy. And I picked up the phone and I called my father. And it was a hard conversation because I didn't know even how to start. It just said, hi, daddy. This is your boy. And there was silence on both our ends for a minute. And we did the chitter chat, how's everybody doing and all of that. And, he, and then he got quiet. And I had a chance to do what the Bible told me to do. And I said, Daddy, will you forgive me for hating you all these years? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And my father broke down in tears. And he said to me, I'm the one that needs forgiving. I'm the one that needs you to forgive me because I was wrong. And I did it to hurt your mother. But I heard it all, you kids, and I'm sorry. Sometimes in life, we got to go to our daddy. And oh, I'm not talking about our physical daddy, but we need to go to our father in heaven and say, sorry, God, I, I offended you, daddy. Daddy, I'm not living the way I should be living. Daddy, I know that I should be a Christian in my heart, and I, I know I should be doing the right thing, but daddy... Will you forgive me and help me to live right? Help me to do the right thing. Oh, Father God in heaven, be with us now. Teach us to do your will. Oh, Heavenly Father, will you love on us enough to wash away our sins and make us whole again? Father, in this epidemic, <coughs> will you speak to us? Will you draw us closer to you? And let us know that you are the God. You are the love of our lives. And you will protect, keep, and give us what we need. In the name of Jesus. I pray, amen. Like a ship that's tossed and driven
then I say to my soul, don't you worry, because the Lord will, he'll make a way somehow. Somehow 